Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's guest is really interesting because of his martial arts background. But before we talk to our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, Six Sigma. You know him. You love him. He did over, how many deals did you do last year, Scott? 198, Mark. I don't like to talk about it. 198 deals. I only did 192. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Today's podcast is sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. In the second that I just talked about it, I just put up 128 ads on Craigslist. Scott, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm a little scared about our guest. Because if we don't do if we don't do this well, he's going to kick our ass. Yeah. You know, I, I like to think that uh, I have a black belt. In what? Uh, land investing. I don't know. Well, let's 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 see if you're. Uh, I think you have a black belt. Def, definitely not a. You know, yeah, I think you do. But let's talk to Sensei Gillian. If you don't know who Sensei Gillian is. He is the founder of Black Belt Investors. Uh, he's based in Southern California. He's the founder and president of Black Belt Investors, began his investing endeavors in 1995. Since that time, Sensei has created cash through wholesale real estate, obtained wealth through rental properties, and continues to teach his methods through seminars, personal training, and club meetings, helping people to achieve their dreams. As a young karate student, he became heavily involved in martial arts competition during his high school and college years. Before long, Sensei received the honor of being ranked one of the top three martial artists in the United States for five years straight. His first year out of high school, Sensei opened the doors to his own martial arts school and to this day owns and operates several schools from which he continues to teach actively. Sensei Gillian. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Mark, you are, Scott, it's a pleasure to have you. You're by far the most disciplined of our guests. Well, that is kind of our tagline, discipline investing. So let's, uh, let's rewind the tape. And, and how did you transition from martial arts into real estate investing? Yeah, great question. You know, um, I always knew that I was going to be a martial arts instructor. And so with that, right out of high school, opened up my first gym, built them up to about 11. And then uh, with that, uh, you know, I knew that martial arts could provide a good living, but it wasn't the living that I was looking for. I wanted a little bit more. And so I was actually looking at coin-op car washes, you know, cash business, don't have to do a lot of maintenance. But I ran into one big problem. The problem was I didn't know anything about real estate. I understood the business concept of uh, coin-op car washes, but I didn't know anything about leasing, build the suit, land, renting. I didn't know anything. And so I did a lot of research, but I found out one thing when I did my research. Real estate controls all businesses. And so with that, I decided to kind of skip right over the uh, coin-op car wash and get right into real estate. I love it. I love it. So you get right into real estate. How did you get started in what niche? <laughs> and well, you know, back then, 1994, um, I was watching infomercial like a lot of people do. And, and uh, you know, the only thing that was really being promoted was buy, fix, and flips because that's the sexy part of real estate investing. That's why we have all the reality shows that we have today. And so I figured, you know what, I'm going to go down to this uh, real estate seminar at LAX checked it out, spent 1500 bucks to go to a three day training. And uh, with that, then they upgraded me to like a $32,000 package of training camps. They didn't call them boot camps back then. They called them seminars or workshops. And, you know, I was taking a, uh, a variety of different trainings, you know, things about buy, fix and flips and wholesaling and, and mobile home parks and just really this buffet of different real estate niches. And I learned that I was getting pulled away from what I was actually after. I had no focus. And the focus was I wanted to buy something, take a dirty dog house and turn it into a pretty doll house. So I wanted to buy it, fix it, and flip it because I understood the concept of buying and sell. You know, you buy low, sell high. And uh, so nine months later, to my surprise, I actually flipped my first property. 
Okay, so then what happened? Well, it's kind of cool. 1995 was a big year because 95 was when I started really all my real estate education. I was dating my wife. <clears throat> she became my fiance. We moved in with each other. We got married. We had a baby. We bought my very first home, which was a uh, pre foreclosure. I rehabbed it, created sweat equity in it. I did a cash out refi and bought my very first fix and flip property in Fort Myers, Florida, all in the year 1995. All right. Fantastic. So why Fort Myers, Florida, if you're from California? Oh, well, price difference. You know, anything here in California back in that time, I had a slap of one in front of the uh, purchase price and I didn't have the cash to be able to purchase property here in Southern California because everything was running about $150,000 and above. But someone told me, hey, pro you know, we've got some investors in Fort Myers, Florida buying, fixing and flipping properties. So I jumped on a plane, went out there, found a couple of properties, made an offer on one, did the traditional transaction where I uh, hooked up with a real estate agent, bought an approved probate, went down to Bank of America, acquired a loan. They only uh, required 10% down at that time. My purchase price was 42000 so I had to put $4,200 down plus a little bit of padding in my bank account. And then I bought myself a property, but then I ran into one huge problem. I didn't have the money for rehab. So with that, I read, I remember reading and, and listening to these old eight tracks about real estate investing, where if you have a good deal, money will flow to it. And so it sure did. I pulled it right out of my credit cards and paid the contractor and every single month for, uh, I transferred balances from one card to the next card to the next card, making this vicious triangle of credit card balances. But, you know, in essence, I took a look at it and said, you know, uh, credit cards is just like a hard money lender, just a better interest rate. And at that time, they were allowing us to transfer credit card balances with no fees. Well, they caught on to people like me, and now they charge us all fees to transfer credit card balances. I love it. I love it. Scott, Todd, what are your thoughts? You're from, you're, you live in Fort Myers. Well, I, I did. I did. I don't, I don't live there anymore. The, uh, uh, you know, what, what, I, uh, what I think is, I mean, I, it's a great story, right? But like, you know, um, where, where I think that a lot of people struggle is like, you really put yourself out there, right? Like you, you really being in, being in California really to go across the country for a deal. Like that's, that's really outside of someone's comfort zone, right? Like a lot of people won't do that. Absolutely. And you know what, especially back then, because we're more accustomed to going out of state, but back in 1995 to go out of state and take that type of risk and not having any type of support or a team and just putting your hands together, hoping and praying that everything gets done properly is, is a, is a huge risk. And, um, you know, and I'll say a lot of luck and I, I tell everybody luck is for people that don't know what they're doing. And that was luck on my side because I was just getting my toes wet and you got to think about it. Back then, we didn't have the internet like we have today. We didn't have digital photos. And so I would get an update, you know, by telephone, hoping that they're telling the truth. And every once in a while, I'd receive in the mail a Polaroid or two of the updates of the property. So yeah, I really did put myself out there. But thank God I did. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you guys today. So, so like, how did you, like, how, I mean, okay, it's kind of hard to say, like, before there was no internet, <laughs> before there was no, no internet. I mean, you, some people listen to this show, like, they've never known a world without the internet. But, like, how, how did you step outside of your comfort zone to, like, really get there to, to, to do that? Well, I always put faith in front of fear. And I think that's what was my biggest thing is putting faith in front of fear. Not only that, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I kind of like the risk taking and, uh, you know, being in martial arts and a lot of other extreme sports that I've done in the past. Uh, I, it was probably an easier transition than it was for my wife. My wife is, you know, I always look at my wife as a crock pot, right? She's when you go to cook something, it's very slow. It turns out great, but it's very slow. And I'm more of the microwave. I'm very fast. I want to go, go, go. And she's a crock. So I scared the hell out of her, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, there, there's enough knowledge there. To, I always tell everybody, if you're a white belt or yellow belt, you know enough to be dangerous to yourself. And that's what I was. I was dangerous to myself. But again, the faith, putting the faith in front of the fear allowed me to learn the process. And the risk factor on the money side was a lot less to do a transaction in Fort Myers than it would have ever been over in California. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's interesting. The uh, the microwave and the crockpot. Scott, would you consider yourself the microwave or the crockpot? I'm the microwave man. I'm just like, <laughs> let me let me just jump into it. I'll figure it out later. Exactly. Yeah, I'm definitely swim. I'm definitely ready fire aim, and yep. and sometimes it it really 
helps. And sometimes like, Oh gosh, I wish I, I slowed down for that, <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. But um, since I, when it comes to real estate training, what is some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your, your area of expertise? The worst advice that I see or hear given in my area of expertise. Um, I've, I've come across quite a few educational companies that have kind of made promises under the table that if you join and pay for their services, that you will do a deal within a year's time. And you can't guarantee something like that. That's probably definitely the worst because a lot of people will take their life savings and invest it into this educational company. And the next thing you know, uh, either the person that invested knows nothing about business. They've probably been a W-2 employee their whole year. They don't know anything about real estate and they're banking on a salesperson to get them a deal in the first year. And that salesperson's not going to get them a deal. He'll give them the tools and the instructions, but never get them a deal. And I've come across that quite a bit. And too many people have lost their life savings. So I suggest to anybody that's going to invest their hard-earned dollar to get the knowledge that they need to turn into wisdom to actually do deals, then they really should research that educator to find out if they're truly the one for them. You know, I'm not going to go to uh, an educator to learn about apartments if someone, if I'm trying to do wholesaling, for an example, and I'm, and I'm definitely would rather have someone in my own backyard if need be, if I can, if I had a knock on their door. So I would say that, you know, just like shopping for your own home or shopping for a car, you don't go to the first dealership. You don't go to the first house and buy it. You need to shop around for your, your uh, trainer as well. I love it. I love it. So sensei today, as far as, you know, where your time is spent, where, where is your time spent mainly as far as the investing realm and the, and the training realm? Uh, the most of the majority of it is by far the uh, investing side. I, I opened up a service back in the year 2000 called Remote Rehabs. And I took with everything that I knew from starting my first property in Fort Myers, Florida to that point and helping investors in California at that time to invest out of state. So I'm, to, to my knowledge, I'm the second oldest company in California pipelining out of state properties into California. And, um, and so I spend most of my time on acquisition is, is where I spend most of my time. The education, that's kind of a breeze for me. I think I'm a natural born educator. I've been teaching martial arts since I was the age of 12. You know, I love getting out in front of crowds and help people and, and building those success stories. And so it doesn't require a lot of effort from my side, but uh, definitely black belt investors, 80, 85% of our business is on the investment side of things. Nice, nice. What do you think of when you hear the word successful? Successful is defined by however you want to define it. You know, if someone says, hey, you know, success to me is quitting my full-time job to go part-time, that's success. You know, uh, success to me, I'll just tell you, Mark, this past week, and I took my family uh, last Friday, and we went down into Mexico, and we built two homes for families that have never had a house. They've been living underneath blue tarps is what they've been doing. And if it wasn't for real estate, I would not have the opportunity to donate my money and my time and give my family the experience to build two homes for families in need. That's my definition of success. That's amazing. That's amazing. I love that. And, you know, Scott Todd smiling, like now, now Scott and I are like just in a, in a big ball of shame. Like we haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my intent. You now, know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, now we're going to have to like, okay, we're going to build three houses in Guatemala. <laughs> Go ahead and one up me. That's okay. Well, I, I, Mark, I don't know that you and I are like, the, I don't think that we are handy enough to build a house, man. Like they, they might be better off if they don't have our house. That's true. We, <laughs> we could help them, you know, fix their computer. Yeah. Could help with like some software, maybe. I'm, I'm, I, I could probably like, you know, fill a hole with some dirt uh, for them. But if I have to like build a house, man, I, they don't want that one. Scott, yeah. you, if you know me, you'll know that I don't have a callus on my hand. I am not out there swinging hammers. But that last week, and I don't have calluses, I have blisters because I decided to dig in a little bit. And it reminded me why I'm in the business I'm in and know how to delegate properly. Yeah. 
You know, it, you know, one of the things that you said that, that really, um, that I really kind of connected with me was the fact that, you know, you can, you can work your entire life with a W2 job and you can switch over and do real estate investing and be successful. Right. But I think that one of the things that people like, uh, under calculate, if you will, is really the strategy or the struggle that it takes to build your business know-how because managing a um, managing an investment business, even though even even if you're just doing real estate investing, it does require you to dig in. Like you were saying about the houses, it requires you to dig in and really pull like everything that that you have out because you have to touch on things that you've never had to touch on before mm-hmm. in your entire life, like marketing or, you know, business decision-making, business skill sets, finance, you know, and it's not necessarily that you can't overcome these things, but if you're, when you're learning how to do something new, there's a lot being thrown at you and you really have to like, you really have to like figure out how you're going to absorb all of this new material and process it and then condition yourself to, to make the right priorities. Because, you know, like I see it all the time. I'm sure you do too. Like, people, people want to gravitate towards the easy stuff, like, and the fun stuff, like, hey, let me come up with a logo for my company, as opposed to, you know, getting out there and doing the, the harder parts of any business, like offers, making offers, or, you know, researching a market. I mean, do do you see the same thing? And what advice do you have to people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's extremely overwhelming uh, there, because as you just mentioned, there's a lot of aspects of in creating a business. And number one, I think what's important for anybody stepping into the entrepreneur world is learning your budget, the budgeting of time and the budgeting of money. And those two things will dictate of how far you can go. And so you know, then we have to prioritize on, on the different aspects needed to be able to progress in our new business. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people, the first thing they do is they come up with some bozo company name that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because there's no branding behind it. Then they run out and get a business card and they get a logo and, and, and they're, that's the easy way. And that's kind of the fun thing to do too, you know, but it's funny because I'll work with a lot of rehabbers and wholesalers and I do a lot of purchase option transactions and that's exactly what they'll do. They'll run out and get a business card. They don't think about their name. They'll go get a website. They'll go get a logo and they're not really thinking about the long haul here. However, a year's gone by and they're saying there's no deals out there or uh, I don't, I haven't done a deal yet. And the next thing I find out is they never made any offers. You know, it's because they're not going into the field and and cultivating that land. They're doing all the surface stuff. And a lot of things that they're doing is also behind the computer. And if it's behind the computer, the masses know about it. And then you find yourself in this pot of, of, you know, dog eat dog. And it's, and it's not allowing them to progress. So I think it's very important that anybody that's going to start a business to step back, take a look. What can I afford in my time? How much can I dedicate per week? How much can I dedicate on a monthly basis, um, uh, a dollar wise, so I can stay within my budget. And then who can I get for consulting? So I know how to grow my business properly because we don't want to build the 13th story of a skyscraper without building the foundation first. Yeah. And I see a lot of parallels with, you know, martial arts and real estate investing. Absolutely. Um, It makes you think of uh, the karate kid where, you know, the guy's starting out and he's like, wash the car, you know, wax on, wax off. And he, and he doesn't see, you know, why he's doing it. And it's not fun. He wants a punch. He wants a kick, right? And it's, it's, he's, he's starting with all the, all the drudgery of, of training. And it's the same thing in, you know, in business and, um, and, and having to embrace sort of these, these sucky, hard components mm-hmm. of the work. So, Sensei, what, what are the things that you see as the, as the biggest parallels between martial arts and real estate investing? Discipline. Discipline is going to be the biggest parallel. If you don't have discipline to dedicate time, discipline to, to budget yourself, discipline to do the work that other people won't do to be able to succeed, it's just not going to happen for you. You know, um, 
I think the analogy you just gave right now in regards to the karate kid of, of he's out there, you know, doing gardening and housework and, and painting and, and waxing and all those other things. He doesn't really know why he's doing it, but he's building up muscle memory is what he's doing, right? It's repetitive action. He, you know, and I can guarantee from when he first started painting to the end of the fence, when he finished painting, he had a better technique. And he was able to probably streamline a little bit quicker than as he began. And a lot of people want that, that easy path. They want that easy path. And, and, and that's because, be honest with you, I think we're just getting lazy. And two, they watch a reality show where they acquire a property. They put in an offer. They, they buy the house. They fix it up. They close it. A bunch of money all within 60 minutes. And then so everybody else wants to do exactly the same. But oh, is being oh, since they were losing you here uh, with the internet, but um, I, I think we got the gist of what you're saying. Are you are you back? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Now we okay, got you. Good. So, as far as the discipline, how can we cultivate being more disciplined? in our real estate investing businesses and in our lives. What's, what's your advice to do that? I, I think it all starts off with the morning time. I think everybody should have some, somewhat of a morning ritual, meaning that uh, they should have some clarity in their mind. They should do some sort of, of goal setting for that day, whether some people write it down on paper, some people punch it into their iPhone, uh, personally, myself, what I do every single morning, and it's a ritual for me, is that I'll wake up, and, I, and I'll be honest, I probably lay in bed for 45 minutes to an hour before I get out of bed. But I'm in bed, and I'm stretching, and I'm breathing, and then I read a verse of the day from the Bible, and then I plan out my day, and I focus on here's what I'm going to get done. And I always put the most difficult tasks first and the easiest tasks last because I know I'm going to be sharpest in the morning and early afternoon than I would be in the later afternoon. And I don't like to procrastinate, even though we all procrastinate, I don't like to do it. So I think, you know, having the, the maybe, I don't know what you call it, a self-hypnosis, uh, goal setting, time for yourself in the morning to be able to set the course of the day and always having some positive information coming in through your ears to set that tone of the day. Yeah, and a great book to help you sort of guide you with that is The Miracle Morning, Hal Elrod. Miracle uh, Morning. Yeah. Have you, have you read that since then? I have not. Oh, you'll love it. You'll I'm love sure it. they have it on audio too, right? Yeah. Yeah. You live <laughs> it. You live it. Uh, Scott Todd, how do you cultivate your discipline? Uh, I, Mark, what I do is I kind of batch my, uh, I batch my activities. You know, this day is set for this, this day is set mm -hmm. for that. And it kind of just becomes almost like muscle memory. Like, you know, you, you wake up and you're like, okay, today's money, money, Monday. I mean, you batch your days, you theme your days, you know, you, you and I record podcasts on Tuesdays. So um, anything that I really need to be at the computer for, Tuesdays is my day to do that. Uh, you know, mon money Monday can, can stretch anything. I'm looking over financials for my business, doing, doing whatever, um, you know, and then it just continues on. And then you know, I, I like to, I really do like to take uh, Mondays and Fridays and really go really easy on those days. You know, like I don't want to over, overtax my brain. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I do the same thing. And I think it's, I know I, I do the time theming as well. And um, what's interesting is that like my wife and I have this ongoing sort of debate where sensei, I'll say like, I'm disciplined and she'll say I have OCD because I have to kind of do these things every morning. Otherwise my day kind of goes haywire. Yeah. And she's like, well, why can't you just not meditate right now? I'm like, but I, I, I really, that's my discipline. She's like, no, that's OCD. So how am I going to win this debate, Sensei? Help me. You have disciplined OCD? I have di okay, I have disciplined <laughs> OCD. But, you know, there are a few, you know, things that you said that I think are so wise, you know, starting early in the morning, taking care of yourself first, mm. and batching your hardest activities, your most mentally taxing activities in the morning when you're freshest. Because, you know, there's, there's two of us. There's present us and there's future us right? Future us has all this energy and all this time and, you know, and all this resolve. And then you get to that future year and you're like, oh, I'm tired, right? No doubt. And, uh, and not having that awareness is, is, is rough. So Sensei, we're at that point now at the podcast where we're going to put you on the spot. And I think your mentorship this, this, uh, 
this podcast has been wonderful. But we're going to ask you for one more tip, a tip okay. of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the Art of Passive Income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Yeah, you know, um, I want to give it. I had a tip planned for today's podcast, but I'm going to change it up because I just went through uh, a consultation with a student of mine that is flipping a house. And, you know, he pulled up the primary data information, which is from the MLS to find out what the after repair values are on a property. And so he had some pretty good, you know, ARVs here. And I'm taking a look at them. And then I turn around and ask him, I said, where are your title comps? He goes, well, why do I need title comps? Because title comps would not be, not necessarily be reflected on the MLS. The MLS comparable sales are all from sales gone through a realty agency, but then you have private sales and those would not be on the MLS. So if you take the MLS and you take the title comps, which will have a mixture of MLS sales and it'll have um, uh, pri private sales, then you may get a higher number. And you know what? We had a number, an ARV number that was $35,000 more than what we found on the MLS. And now he can target a higher number. And so he could have been left leaving a lot of money on the table. So my, my tip is when you run comps, you run them off the MLS and you get title comps as well because you might be missing something. Great tip. I love it. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, I, um, I cannot stand these websites that you go to and, you know, like you're sitting there and you're trying to read something and maybe you're trying to be quiet and all of a sudden they get the autoplay video going, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and you're trying to turn it down. You're trying to be, you know, like, yeah, I'm watching, uh, I'm watching TV and you're really like, you know, surfing on the internet and, you know, you, you, the, the websites rat you out, right? I can't stand it. So I went on a hunt and I found a Google Chrome plugin called Disable HTML5 Autoplay. And you know, it's uh, I can just imagine like in my corporate days, like maybe I was in a conference, a conference or something or a meeting, and I'm like doing, you know, some some little web surfing, and then all of a sudden this video pops up and you're like, oh, not paying attention you know, do yourself a favor, just download this little app. It, it just makes it so that the videos just don't start playing in, at the inappropriate time. And, uh, you know, brings a little bit of joy to my life. Uh, I love that. I love it. I'm getting that for sure. <laughs> well, and it's my, free. Like, it's free. free. You must really hate it to do that type of research, but I like it. <laughs> uh, I couldn't, like, I literally, like, it was just these, these videos were just popping up at the wrong time. And I'm like, I can't stand this. There's got to be a solution. There yeah. is. Scott, are you outsourcing your uh, your tips of the week? Are you having fancy hands do research? Like, <laughs> no, find me a tip no, of the I, week. I I don't want to put my name on unless I actually like you know actually do it. You know, like so I, I I spend time, Mark. I spend time doing them. All right, awesome, awesome. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about Sensei Gillian and the art of discipline and real estate investing at blackbeltinvestors.com. Blackbeltinvestors.com. Sensei, are are we good? Oh, we're good. I wish we had more time, but I'm glad you guys had me on board. Scott, are we good? Mark, are great. All right. Well, I want to thank all the listeners and just remind them the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Sensei Gillian from blackbeltinvestors.com is if you do us two little favors, actually three little favors, I should say. You got to subscribe, you got to rate, and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of your review to support at thelandgeek.com. We are going to send you for free the Passive Income Launch Kit. That's a $97 value. Nothing to sneeze at, right, Scott Todd? Nothing to sneeze at at all. And also, start automating your Craigslist postings. Don't, don't waste time. You can always make more money. You can't get more time. Go to postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott, should we? <laughs> Mark, let's. Uh, I'll just let you, you do what? it. I'll just do it. How about you? All right. Let freedom ring sensei's like man you guys would not wouldn't last a day in my dojo with Dude, your you guys got to yell that ring. out like you know from braveheart that type of yell that out let freedom ring there you go <laughs> all right we'll work on it all right thanks everybody all right thank you <laughs>